Welcome to Friends and Fiction, four New York Times bestselling authors, endless stories. Novelists Mary Kay Andrews, Kristen Harmel, Christy Woodson Harvey, and Patty Callahan Henry are four longtime friends with more than 70 published books between them. Together, they host Friends and Fiction with author interviews and fascinating insider talk about publishing and writing to highlight and support independent bookstores. They discuss the books they've written, the books they're reading now, and the art of storytelling. If you love books and you're curious about the writing world, you're in the right place. Hi, everyone. It is Wednesday night, and that means it is time for Friends in Fiction. It's our most favorite night of the week, and tonight we are so excited to introduce you to Vivian Howard, along with our superstar guest co-host, Ron Block. (laughs) Our Kristen (laughs) is out tonight for her brother's wedding, and we're thrilled that Ron has joined us to talk to Vivian. I am Patty Callahan Henry. I'm Christy Woodson Harvey. I'm Mary Kay Andrews. And I am Ron Block. And thank Obviously. you for having me here because <laughs> it so feels glad. like I, in the old days when I used to get invited from the kids table to the grown ups table, oh. you know, <laughs> which is perfect for tonight, right? <laughs> Definitely. Oh, I love that. Tables, my buddy. Yeah. <laughs> I prefer the kids' table, to be honest. <laughs> and there's more wine at the grown up table than that. That's true. I, I changed my mind. So. <laughs> and this is Friends in Fiction, four New York Times bestselling authors. Endless stories to support independent bookstores. This evening, not only do we have our rock style, rock star, librarian and host of our Writer's Block podcast, but our guest for the evening is Vivian Howard. We'll be talking about her blockbuster shows, Southern food, her storytelling cookbooks, and possibly even ask her for a few tips for the upcoming holidays. We even have a surprise cover for you in the middle of the show, so keep your eyes out. As you know, we continue to encourage you to support independent booksellers when and where you can, and one way you can do that is to visit our own Friends in Fiction bookshop.org page where you can find Vivian's books and books by the four of us and our past guests at a discount. Bookshop.org gives a portion of each sale to independent bookstores, and it also helps support the show. So if you enjoy watching, this is a great way to support our guests, independent bookstores, and the Friends and Fiction group all at the same time. And have you heard about our exciting partner this month and next month? It's a perfect timing, I think. It's Butterball Turkey. We're especially excited about this because it means we get to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the famed Turkey Talk line, which I like to call anyway, just to talk to those people. They're awesome. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Crank calls. (laughs) No. We're all going to call sure. like 10 times on, on Thanksgiving just to see what That's they right. say. That's right. Make sure you join us on our Talk in Turkey with Butterball after show tonight. We'll be chatting about the history of the Turkey Talk line and mentioning some of our favorite turkey recipes, which we'll be sharing with you in November and December. And this week, let's talk about the parade essay. Kristen wrote an essay for our monthly column for Parade Magazine. And of course, it's all about Thanksgiving and the time when she was in her late 20s, and she had an idea to throw a Friendsgiving. She found herself suddenly cooking dinner in a rush for 10 people. Well, that's our Kristen taking care of everybody. Mm -hmm. Soon she realized that Thanksgiving really is not about panic cooking, but it's more about the time we spend with each other. And she gives us some stress-free cooking recipes from our guest today, the turkey Mm -hmm hotline turkey talk hotline and i think we've even got some recipes from us in there yeah oh yeah yeah. she included us Mm -hmm. and as our guest vivian today says and is quoted in Kristen's article thanksgiving can be anything you want it to be the holidays are all about breaking bread with friends and family and being grateful for what we have Yeah, so be sure and go check out the essay on Parade.com and on our Facebook page Um, and go and read it because you'll want to see this recipe for salt and butter roasted pecans that I'm already making. 
Yum. And speaking of yeah. thanks, we want to give a big shout out to our friend Anissa Armstrong, who you all yes. know if you're on the page, for all her time and energy coordinating our launch day love each and every Tuesday. We love sharing the love for fellow <laughs> authors with new books releasing each week. And Anissa spends loads of time gathering these for us. We are so grateful. Thank you, Anissa. There she is with um, Brenda and Lisa. And oh, oh, look, I love all the flat us's. That's really, really Even cool. you are in there, Ron. That's yes, hilarious. look at I made yeah, it. <laughs> you made, there's a flat Ron. All right, y'all. Right now, I want to introduce our guest, Vivian Howard, an award-winning cookbook author, TV personality, chef, restauranteur, and all-around interesting and kind person. Agreed. Um, her first cookbook, Deep Run Roots, Stories and Recipes from My Corner of the South, was released in 2016. It was a New York Times bestseller and named Cookbook of the Year by the International Association of Culinary Professionals. In October of 2020, she released her second cookbook, This Will Make It Taste Good, A New Path to Simple Cooking. Astounding. Vivian also created and stars in the public television show Somewhere South and A Chef's Life, for which she has won Peabody, Emmy, and James Beard Awards. That's mm -hmm. got to be the hat trick, right? I, That's I, a try. I would say yeah. so. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty, pretty good. impressive. She runs the restaurant Chef and a Farmer in Kinston, North Carolina, Benny's Big Time in Wilmington, and Handy and Hot in Lenore in Charleston, South Carolina. And I am personally so excited to have her today. I've known her for a long time and um, she is an amazing person. And man, if anybody can teach you how to make something taste good, it is Vivian because her food is, is definitely life changing. As her stories in that book. Yes. I mean, yeah. She yeah, really she's opens up. Double in that whammy. Book. Yeah. yeah. All right. Let us bring Vivian on. Sean. Here she is. Hello. There you are. Hey. <laughs> Y'all made me feel so, um, I was blushing. Thank you. So aren't you glad that you didn't have to sit with your face on screen while we were saying all that? I would have never you? done that. I would have like laid down on the floor or something. <laughs> Just turn the camera off. That's why we do that. So we can talk about you behind your back. Well, welcome, Vivian. We are so excited that you're here. I know I said it off camera, but I'll say it here. If you could see our text string in the past couple of days, we have been raving about this cookbook and talking about what we're each going to make. I made the nuts yesterday and I'm going to all the ingredients for the little green dress oh, great. done it. Yeah. And so did Mary Kay. Yeah. So y'all are going to be really jealous when I tell you this story, but I got to get an early copy of this cookbook uh -uh. and it had a jar of Vivian's red devils already. Yeah. In it. So it was like, I can make it taste good and I don't even have to do no. anything. Yeah. Which is great. Yes. Yeah. Amazing. I took advantage of her so, mail order things during the pandemic. And oh yeah. I got to try all of the things like the little green dress. Oh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All amazing. Oh my gosh, great with yo. Well, if you, well, we'll probably get there, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get there for sure. But before we dive into all the fascinating things in the cookbook and tips and the fascinating combination of storytelling and cooking, I love how you open the book, the line in the front that says, there are stories in this too, because I like to write them. They are a glimpse of the people challenges, triumphs, and lessons learned, I love this, that stock the pantry of who I am. Nice. I love that. So before we dive deep into where it came from and the things inside, I want you to tell us about this will make it taste good. Um, thank, well, you know, I, I had written this like, you know, kind of historical document cookbook that I really felt um, represented the food of Eastern North Carolina, a very small place, and also um, the, the stories behind the food. And writing that book, I found that like what I really loved doing was writing the head notes and writing the essays and the stories. And, you know, mm -hmm. I can write a recipe and I love inflecting like natural voice into a recipe. Um, but what I felt like was really successful in my first book um, was the the narrative quality of it. And 
And so after that, it's like, where do you go after writing a 600 page thing? You know, you go to bed. Like, uh, I'm sure y'all understand like I, this idea of like a two book deal. Like I, I, you know, I'd never written a book before deep run roots. And so I signed this two book deal and I'm like, Oh my God. Like it, originally I thought, Oh, I can write a million books, but I just wrote like a million books, in one book. Yeah. And, and so the second one was a real challenge for me because I proposed a number of things that were like shot down, um, a, a lot. And I kept coming back to this. One of, one of the ideas was this um, book that was like, I wanted to write something very simple, like simple Vivian, because I read the mm -hmm. reviews on uh, Amazon every day for a year for Deep Run Roots. Don't and do that. I know, but I mean, I wouldn't have kept reading if they weren't positive. It's what I, you know, <laughs> I'm not understanding. Don't that. do that. <laughs> Um, as a restaurateur, like reviews, I don't know. I have a different relationship with them, I think. Um, but so I read those. And one of the things that I, you know, read over and over was I want something simple. I want the recipes are too complicated in this book. And so that was like my diatribe, you know, writing my second book. And I had this whole idea for, you know, like four or five ingredient recipes. And then the last the last chapter in the book was called this will make it taste good. And it was like, if you want to make all these other recipes really great in this book, <laughs> make all these condiments. And that was the only part of the book that I was excited about writing because I had stories oh. attached to them. And so I proposed to flip the whole idea on its head and write this book about these flavor heroes, these condiments that we have made at chef and the farmer um, for years. And that when I stopped working at, chef and the farmer so much that I would like break into the restaurant at night and like steal these condiments, take them home with me so that I could like make really simple food, exciting at home. And so that's what it's about. There's 10 chapters. Each one is about one of these condiments, but I get to give them identities and, um, and personalities and names and I don't so know. Fun. It was cool. It's very cool. It's That's very cool, cool for sure. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the book is is a joy. I, I um recently made your sauerkraut in it, and it's it's like you said, it's like that's the main thing, but then you can um use it for so many other things beside it. It's it's delicious. But how did this book come out of COVID? Was it written before COVID or during COVID? So I had started writing it like earnestly in August, maybe July, August. And, um, and then COVID happened in March. And so I had almost finished it in March, like writing it, but not the essay portion, not really the narrative portion. And then all this happened and, yeah. um, and you know, the pandemic happened and we shut the restaurants down and like, we're looking for a way to, uh, have a, a revenue stream to keep some people employed and to also just have some purpose. Like I, my whole life has always been about work. Like if I don't have work to go to, then I just disintegrate. Um, yeah. and so, you know, the book was happening and I was also watching all these people on social media, like cooking and like really engaged in cooking. And I'm like, and, but really bored by it too. And so I'm like, God, this book, like these condiments, this is what people need. And so finishing the book, like got me through the beginning of COVID. And then like, as you said, Ron, y'all, you ordered some, uh, our red weapons and little green dress. We sold, yep. sold these pandemic, you know, kind of care packages, not care packages, but survival kits um, with recipes in ways awesome. to use the condiments. And it was like a lifesaver. I mean, it literally, and then, you know, everybody thought the pandemic was going to last a month, but it lasted. Yeah, we remember that part. Oh, yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. Oh, two it's weeks. like a snow day. Yeah. Book. We finished yeah. writing, yeah. I finished writing the book. We finished shooting the book. We sold the several of the condiments from the book, and then the book came out all during the pandemic. So it was yeah. like, wow, it's never ending. And I guess we're still in it. So mm -hmm. we are. But the operative word through all this is pivot. I think you really had to pivot, as, yeah. as all, so many yeah. of us did. Mm -hmm. And you you kind of pivoted and with your television personality too, because I think I read that you you said <laughs> with the chef's life, I'm not doing this anymore. I want to do this other thing. And then so something new came out of that. I mean, that's hard for any of us to do, but but how did you approach uh, these changes? 
Um, you know, I think that you would get a different answer from the people around me, but I really, I, 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 I can only do things that I, I feel like I, I feel good about, you know? Right. Um, and so like a chef's life, I just couldn't do it anymore. And so I, I had, you know, I, and so I stopped and I wanted to do something else. You know, I think that, um, things, I, I, what I've learned about myself and it's been a lot of therapy that should have answered the question about, um, what I've come to know during the pandemic that I can't do without is therapy. Mm -hmm. Um, and what I've learned is that I really love creative endeavors. I love the beginning of them. I love the middle of them. That's why I love books so much is because it's like, you know, you, 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 go on this journey and you know when it's going to end and you know, like kind of the process and it's like a creative explosion in the beginning and, and, but then it ends. And so I've learned that about myself and our, my restaurant projects, my book projects, my television projects. Um, and I also understand that when I'm not like fully present, things are not really that successful that I'm a part oh, of. Okay. And so I feel like my own personality and, eccentricities and quirks have forced me to pivot <laughs> and those, yeah. and those around that. me. It's wonderful. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if that's wonderful, um, but, but it is, it is well, uh, my reality, I think. Uh, yeah. It and is the receiving one, end. It's yeah. Good. And the receiving end. It's wonderful. And it's exactly what you say when you open the book with your quote, to the corners we find ourselves in that force novel and creative ways out. I feel like that's what you just described. Exactly. Yes. Yes. And that's yes. like that, um, you know, we all have these survival mechanisms in our, yeah. in our lives. And mine has always been to throw myself in something creative and it could be like a dish on a on the menu when everything is burning around me and yeah. I can just like survive cause I can make that and focus on that or a book or, you know, um, or a TV project, um, it's my survival mechanism. Yeah. Yeah. I, we said, we've said that a couple of times about what we're doing, that it was our, our, our salvation in the, when everything else was burning around us, you could funnel your creative energy into this or into the book, but the writing in this cookbook is, I have to be honest, is as tasty as the recipes. And I loved hearing your stories. I can, now that I'm hearing your voice, I can even hear your voice in the essays. They're so authentic. And I love your pep talk at the front <laughs> of the cookbook. That I love says, that too. Yeah. I just love it. it. Just, you can, and what would Vivian do? I, I just, it's amazing. So how do you see storytelling and recipes as partners? Because obviously they are. Um, well, I've always thought that I'm like a far better storyteller than I'm, I, I am a cook. And mm. so like our, I mean, I think I'm a, a, a good cook, but um, there are a lot of great cooks out there. So at Chef and the Farmer, I found we, we always had more traction when there was a story attached to a recipe. You know, people were more interested in it. They gave it yeah. more, you know, more time to consider. And um, and so I, I feel like that is at the root of kind of what I do is um, blending and food and, and thought and purpose and history. Yeah. And, um, and, and food is something that we all engage in and we all, you know, we have this whole mantra of like, we, we're going to sit around the table and, and talk and, and, yeah. and have this moment when we're breaking bread be the moment that we're sharing. But for some reason we have a hard time taking food out of the context of food. I don't know. It's, it's, it's interesting to me in that, like, there are not, there have not been that many narrative cookbooks written you know, mm -hmm. where, where the, the recipes relate or the head notes really relate to something bigger than just like what you're making for dinner. Um, when food is such a, a huge part of our, our lives. Um, I think it makes it more interesting to cook when, yes. when what you're cooking or making or baking, I like baking better than cooking, but when what you're baking or making has a story behind it, because reading the front end material made me even more excited 
to try and make the little green dress mm. or the nuts or the that then I could use in something else. And Mary Kay did that in her. You did that in your cookbook. You put stories. Oh, not yeah, them. not on not on the level that Vivian Vivian did. Um, you know, Vivian, your first restaurant was at the forefront of the farm to table movement. And in Deep Run, you talked about the challenge of offering farm grown healthy food to a community that had grown away from their rural roots and, and had really formed more of an attachment to cheap, fast or processed food. Mm -hmm. Now, with the new book, you're continuing your mission of trying to lure cooks back to simple sort of, I don't know, would you call it clean eating? I, you know, I don't, I don't know that I'd call it clean eating. I, one of the things that I've always advocated for is like um, just buying whole ingredients. Right, right. And, right. you know, I live in, in rural North Carolina. And so whenever I write a cookbook um, from this will make it taste good for, I didn't take this into account with Deep Run Roots because it was very like region specific. And I had a whole mm -hmm. chapter on muscadine grapes. But whenever mm -hmm. I write a cookbook moving forward, it's like, can you buy this at all of these ingredients at any Walmart in America. Right. So, um, you know, yes. when you were, um, we were talking about, you talked about how many of us were in the kitchen during COVID putting, putting, we were putting up preserves and baking sourdough bread yes. and gardening. Do you think you're seeing progress in your community and in the country at large towards more of using whole fresh ingredients instead of um uh you know whip topping in a tub from the freezer 100 percent, yes yes okay, i would great. say you know in my community alone and which is where i feel like there was a lot of a lot of space to to catch up um i think that it's all about generations and mm -hmm. the younger generation across socioeconomic groups, I think cares more about what they eat and cares more like just thinks about it more. That's um, right. So true. And, and there's small little steps, you know, yeah. um, we didn't all start going to McDonald's like overnight either. Yeah. You know, yeah. that was a top, that was a top down, like, you know, rich people went to McDonald's first mm -hmm. and then yeah. that's how it became cool. Um, and so I think that, Absolutely. We're, we're moving in the right direction. Um, we largely have to. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you see another movement coming, another food movement coming that you're going to surf the wave of? Maybe you'll pioneer it. Um, well, I'm working on a new project that I'm really excited about, and it's really Ooh. probably too early to Come on, um, tell us. Well, I really <laughs> believe that one of the things. It's not too I've, early for us. It's not too well, early. Well, I'm just. You're it's among friends. Very basic. So I, this idea of, um, you know, I've written about rural wisdom for a long time. And the food that um, this will make it taste good represents and the food that uh, Deep Run Root represents, Deep Run Roots represents is really founded in this idea of like uh, the food of the frugal farmer or people who grow most of the food that they eat. And so in this new world that we're in like facing climate change and 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 really having to consider the 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 way that we move forward the way that we consume the way that we cook the foods that we eat um so much of the the precursor the, the messages that we get about what we do directly reflect back to the way that rural people have always eaten less meat don't waste anything um you know, uh, and and so I want to do something that is uh, that that looks forward, but is really rooted in the wisdom and the traditions of uh, rural people who oh, awesome. really placed wow. a lot of value on food and land. And that's I think awesome. that that's been lost in so many ways. Um, I don't think it's something that we acknowledge as a culture and society. And I think it's important because we're trying to find all these new solutions. And I think they're incredibly important as well. But we were doing things right for a period of time. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm in for this. Mm. <laughs> that, Ron, I'm, I'm going to call you. Are you, are you right? <laughs> we are in for Please this. do. Please do. <laughs> it reminds me. Um, I think you're, I'm going to get this wrong. But your mom said something. Or maybe you said that your mom said that a sweet potato has everything that you need. I think about that all the time. 
Like, yeah, oh, everything you need is in a sweet potato. So if anyone's like getting sick, I'm like, oh, we need a sweet potato because <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um, no, it's funny too, like reading the book and um, and knowing all the players in it, you know, like, especially like, I feel like I know like Lorraine really well from yeah. like, doing Pilates with her every morning for years and, you know, things like that. Um, it's just, it was so fun to get to, you know, read these essays and feel like I got this like real glimpse into, you know, your family and um, which I guess, I guess we all did on a chef's life. I mean, I guess we really yeah. did, but um, you were extremely honest in this book, which, you know, we've talked about before. I think we talked about on the podcast um, but about how you felt after this breakthrough success of your first cookbook, this massive hit show, this incredibly, am I having feedback? Mm -hmm. we, have an, we have an echo. I'm sorry. Hang on. I hate that so much when it happens and you're I'm like, I'm just going to keep going. And you can hear it in your own yeah, ear. And yeah, and I'm going crazy. <laughs> yeah. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, but you're really honest about how you had all these expectations on you after that. Like everything was going so well for you and it just felt really, really heavy. And I think, you know, in some ways, all of us are living this public life, maybe not as much as you, but in some ways we are. Um, and how do you manage that? And have your ideas around, you know, the expectations of that shifted? Because I think especially in the beginning, it's really hard because you feel like you have such a responsibility to every single person. Yeah out there it's true yeah i mean it's been a big issue for me you know um yeah. just being in such a rural place and and having a show in particular that was like so like i was just bare on it you know people thought that they knew me and so people were traveling from all over the world to come eat there and i'm not there and then it's like a, such a huge disappointment for them yeah. and i could feel it like in every, every part of my life. And that's one of the things I'll write about and this will make it taste good. Like I, I, I charted another way home from my office. So I didn't have to ride past the restaurant and see how many people on any given night that I was disappointing. Mm -hmm. And so COVID actually has been a big gift for me because, um, it's kind of like, fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, sorry. <laughs> um, but I is it, it, you can only give so much to people and I'm a people pleaser. It's another thing yeah. that I really write about. And, and so it's like, if I engage with someone, I, I'm going to try to please them. Yes. So COVID has allowed me to just like put up some boundaries. Like I don't have to do that if I don't want to. Um, and the TV thing too, uh, has been interesting because I've always seen TV for me as a means to an end to be able to write books and to just be like financially, just to be able to do projects that I want to do. I don't necessarily enjoy being on TV, I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, people- Except with us, there's exceptions. Right, right, right. right, right. <laughs> you're so good at it though. Like you're very, well, you're, you're engaging on TV. You right. and we want the camera. We wanna, and, yeah. yeah, we all want to do things that we are good at, right? And yeah. so, um, you know, through COVID, I, it's like, do I want to be on TV? And, and do I, and what I've come to the conclusion of is that I want to do, I want to do TV or anything that puts me in the, public sphere if it really matters like it's, it's uh, this feels like a sacrifice in some way so i'm not going to do it to like earn a living because i know i can earn a living in other ways so it's yeah. like is is this going to contribute to something that is bigger and important what i believe is important and so that yeah wow it makes you have to talk a lot around here yeah, talk <laughs> about all of that you're always putting things on the scale right? Yeah. Is it, yeah. is it worth it? Is it, is it worth it? Yeah. Is it important? And people pleasing is every single person on this screen has to yeah. navigate that, which is, I think why we're in creative fields. It's probably like why, to get ourselves, right? Yeah. So. It's probably why for me, it's why I started writing when I would get in trouble as a kid. Yeah. Or not why I started writing, but I think I knew I was good at it. I would like write, I would get sent to my room or whatever. And I would write a little, account of what happened from my, oh my perspective gosh. and then i would just like 
leave my room and like throw it on the kitchen table and leave it, you know, go in the yard or something and know that my family would slowly, you know, gravitate toward it and read it. And then I would come in and everything would be good. And, oh, wow. <laughs> and so it was like, yeah, my original people, people pleaser, I guess thing. You know, I listened in. to, um, Katie Couric's podcast about her new book going there. And she talked a lot about being a people pleaser and, and um, how that affected her career in broad 40 years in broadcasting. And it was, yeah, it's something all of us, I think it, you, you we're not, I don't think of myself really as in the public eye, but you know, when someone writes you an you email, are. Sorry. Somebody people stop you on the street and go, Oh my God, are you Mary Kay Andrews? That's, That's in the public being in the public eye. Eye. Yeah, that is. That definitely is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you want it, you want to please everyone, but some yes. sometimes you just have to pull back. Um, for us. She doesn't care about pleasing us. She just says no. no. She just says no to us. Wow. She's that's found it. her boundaries in one yeah, place. She's like, us. <laughs> that's what my children say. They're like, you, you're cool. Like talking, you know, giving everybody else everything. But, you know, it's like, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you can be. Yeah. You know, Speaking somebody of, in the in the questions is asking about your children, Vivian. Yeah. Um, I see one that says, um, now that your children are are older, do they like to cook? No, <laughs> no. I think they, that they're um, from a restaurant family. Yeah. Yes, and you know, I have I have had a lot of issues with that. Um, hence, therapy, ther uh, pandemic therapy. You know, it's like virtual therapy is great. You can get it almost any time. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I food has always been such a hot button issue in my house. You know, it's like my work, it's Ben's work, you know, um, it's, it's the thing that takes me in large part away from them as they see it, whether it's writing cookbooks or, you know, and so it's not, it, and, and also I'm incredibly impatient, um, you know, in the kitchen, it's like, I, I want them to do what I ask them to do and they don't. And, um, and so it's not been a safe, it. happy place for us. Um, yeah. It's I find that I'm better engaging with them in, in places where I'm also learning. Um, so, yeah. There's not only a question, but a man wrote in named Stephen Vaughn. And he <laughs> said, speaking of pleasing somebody, he said, I'm a 70 year old man born in Farmville, Virginia raised near DC, but never have I lost my country roots. And that's why I'm here. Plus I lost my wife 13 years ago and can't cook. Vivian has taught me a lot. Oh, oh wow. Oh, that's that beautiful. Thank you. you. Isn't that beautiful? So if you're yeah. wondering if you're making a difference, that's amazing. That's right there. Um, right there. Kath, Mary Kay, you want to pull another question? Yeah. Um, let's see. Moira Stevens says, my mother used to take cookbooks to bed like most of us take novels. I think she would have loved your idea of combining a narrative with the recipes. And, you know, I, I did the same right. thing. I'm, I'm locked. I'm on, I'm on lockdown finishing a book, but I took uh, the cookbook to bed with me the other night. Yeah. <laughs> we were texting about it. It's funny. Yeah. I think that, you know, in, in this, in today's world where you can, you know, if you want to make chicken with Brussels sprouts and olives for dinner, you can Google chicken with Brussels sprouts and olives and find, you know, any number of things. Like if for me, cookbooks need to bring more value than just recipes yeah. and just like lame, like opening, like head notes. I want something that is like fully fleshed out and really creative and, and, I, I want it to be more like way more than just recipes. I can't tell you the last time I actually made a recipe from a cookbook, but I love cookbooks. So, yeah. um, and I think there's a lot of people that feel that way. Um, yeah, it's immersive an immersive yeah. cookbook. And I always want to know more about the person writing it or more yeah. about the recipe or more about the, their recipe for success or their restaurant. And so, yeah. Awesome. 
Christine. We have a lot of questions for you, but um, I'm going to be selfish and ask one of my own because- <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. We were talking about Butterball at the beginning of the show. It's turkey time. And do you have any tips for us about you know, how to make our turkey taste good? <laughs> You know, turkey is not the easiest thing in the world. It's not. Mm -hmm. No, it's not. But what I would recommend, and I recommend this with not only turkey, but if you're cooking a whole chicken, any whole bird, is spatchcocking it. Do you know what I mean by What's that? that? No. no. So if you are not buying a frozen turkey and buying it from a butcher, you can probably ask if they'll do this for you. But if not, it is really, really easy. So whenever you spatchcock a bird, all you do, it has to be thawed. So just know that. But all you do is cut the backbone out. Like you can use a knife. You can use like kitchen shears. Cut the backbone out and then take the bird and flatten it. And just like... I have not press down on it. So essentially you're taking this whole like steaming like mechanism that is the cavity of the bird that is a terrible way to cook something and removing it and you're you're cooking it on a flat surface. So for one you're going to like cut down on the cooking time tremendously. For two it's going to cook more evenly. So that would be, if I could tell you anything, I could tell you about brining. I could tell you about soaking it in buttermilk. I could tell you about like all kinds of things. But if you spatchcock your bird and, and I would also recommend, this is a great tip. So get, um, take yeah. some like rustic sourdough bread or any kind of chewy European bread, put it, you know, cut it into, um, you know, I, I would buy a loaf like this and like slice it in half, like one inch slices, put it underneath the turkey. Okay. Oh, okay. Just underneath the turkey. And, but only if it's spatchcocked, because if you put it underneath the turkey and it's whole, it'll take too long and the bread will burn, but put it underneath the turkey, put some herbs underneath that. If you want like some rosemary or some thyme, whatever, lemon, and then roast it like that on a sheet tray with the mm. bread underneath it. And you won't even like want any stuffing. That bread is going to be the best thing you've ever had. Now, can you still get the pan juices for your gravy? Um, yes, yes. And actually for a, a better tutorial on how to do this, you should look in, this will make it taste good. Little green okay. trash chapter. And there's like a chicken toast recipe. Oh yeah, I saw that. Yes, but you're not gonna pick the you're not you're not gonna take the chicken off the bone for this. You're gonna like yeah. roast the turkey and and the little green dress would be a great condiment to have with that. Okay, that sounds so good. It makes me want to go make it right now. Oh, yeah, I'm looking for yeah. it right now. I actually yeah. made a turkey like two days ago, just in like preparation. But I hope Will was listening to this. He's really good at spatchcocking chicken, so I'm hoping. Yeah, my husband's good at it. Honestly, too. he's our turkey. He's our yeah, turkey yeah. My my husband is too. He's he's, he's the best. He's, and he's the meat man. Like my yeah. whole like my aunts, uncles, everybody. He's the best. I really well, think whatever. Okay, Ron, you want to put one? Sorry. I do, but first I want to say I'm a big fan of the spatchcock, and that's what I'm doing with the turkey this year. I just like to hear people say it. <laughs> <laughs> you spatchcock. You're not oh, the only one, right. Ron. Uh, I just the spatchcock <laughs> chicken in a book and got so many questions about it that like yeah. it was unbelievable. And I was like, I, wow, I didn't. This is amazing. <laughs> yeah. I just want to casually drop it in conversation. Spatchcock. <laughs> Oh, do you know about spatchcocking? Yeah, well, you can, can that. if you, you spatchcock your chicken on Thanksgiving, you can say I spatch I just spatchcock my chicken, my my yeah, thank my turkey. Spatch. There you go. There you go. Yeah. So we have Did we you? This great, great question about um if there's any immigrant influence in your cookbooks or in your dishes in your restaurant. Um well, I I choose to look at like my regional cooking as a um, as all immigrant influence, you know, like right. everyone in Eastern North Carolina came there from somewhere else and somewhere South in particular is about the ever evolving, uh, food culture of the South. You know, it, it literally, the, the precipice for the show is like how the food traditions we bring to the place where we are shape that place and how that place 
shaped the food traditions we bring. And so like a very early like example that I like to use that actually inspired a chef's life was my neighbors um, making collard kraut. And um, you know, they made it for the, forever. But the idea of like th them, th their ancestors coming from Eastern Europe and landing in, you know, Eastern North Carolina and finding collards, which, you know, were a, 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 an ingredient that came here from arguably two different places, one being Africa. Um, and, and then applying that technique of that kraut to the collards. I mean, that's the, that's an example of like mm -hmm. immigrant influence and, and, and a way that our cuisine as Americans evolves. And so, yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's great. I that. God, I, I love collards. And the, the more you know about the food we're eating, the more interesting it is. And then the more you want to make it from whole food. And right. not buy it pre-prepared or already slathered in something to hide its flavor. Oh, I just love this. So one of our favorite parts of the show is the segment where we get to ask you for a writing tip. And your writing is so personal and it's not fictional, but you must have a writing tip to help us kind of tap into that personal authenticity in an essay. It's just beautiful. So I've been thinking about this a lot because I knew the question was coming. Yeah. And um, I, I've been asked about like my method for writing before. And I just really, I don't know. Um, I think I think about, so I write this column for Gar Garden and Gun as I've had four so far. And I do most of the writing before I ever write it. Like, so I just think I, I drive a lot because I work here in Charleston. And so I just think, 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 and I know exactly what it's going to be. And then I write it. Oh, and, wow. uh -huh. um, and that was the same way with the essays in this will make it taste good and deep run roots. Like I, I spent a lot of time um, thinking about it and then I just like, just write it. I don't know. I, I know that that, but there's a lot of, it seems like there's not a lot of time, but I spend a lot of time musing on what it's going to be um, I love and, that. and what I want to say. And I always try to make sure before I start writing anything that I know what I want to say, like not necessarily what it is, like, you know, what the, the, the movement of it's going to be, but like what the end purpose of it is. That's awesome. Pre-writing. Do you pre-writing? Pre like, do you write down, oh, here's three things, here's three points I want to get across in this essay? No, but I'm going to try that. That's <laughs> 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 what you're already doing. Yeah. I, mean, I think I'm kind different. of doing that. You know, I think yeah. if I try to do something bigger, like a book, you know, okay. I would have to do that. But with an essay, like so far, you know, my, my experience has been kind of singular, you know? Um, that's, that's so interesting because I think I do that too, but like specifically with essays. And so like, I have a hard time, like I just wrote an essay for an anthology and I pitched something and then I had this totally different idea. Like it just sort of like popped up, but I'll always say like, no, like I'll, when I know what it is, I'll feel it. Like I'll feel what the thing is. Like you feel yeah. that thing and you know, and you, you aren't saying in your head, like the sentences, but you just you know the story. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's exactly what happened. Yeah. So like my, I'm writing, um, I have a, my column due for garden and gun, um, on Friday. And I had pitched this idea to write the story about this church that is, uh, um, across in between my house and the house that I grew up in. And I've passed this church my whole life. I've never even been in it. And I went in it like a month ago and it felt holy and I'm not religious. And it was just this big thing. And so I was like, I want to write about this. And then I started writing it and I'm like, this is not what I want to write about, but yeah. I've taken pictures of the church and the illustrator has it. And, and so I'm like, yeah. um, yeah, but you know, you know, like I knew yeah. like, yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. I, I didn't. Yeah. Wow. Common experiences are good. Okay. So do you have a book that you could recommend for our fabulous audience tonight? Yeah. Well, I thought that I would recommend another narrative cookbook and like the one that kind of inspired the way that I approached 
I approach um, cookbooks. It, it's Edna Lewis's The Taste of Country Cooking. And okay. it's um, an older book, but she blends uh, recipes and food traditions and family and culture uh, in a way that really made me uh, feel as if I could celebrate the really mundane kind of basic things that I grew up eating. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. Oh, that sounds awesome. Yeah. Edna Lewis is just uh, the best. Her, her writing and recipes are amazing. It's yeah. Beautiful. I have the cookbook she did with, um, she did a cookbook with a guy uh, who Scott was Peacock. Scott yeah, Peacock. Scott Peacock. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I have that book and have cooked from it. It's wonderful. Yes. Now my cookbook TBR is growing as if I need more <laughs> books in the house. <laughs> I already know what cookbook I'm getting everybody for Christmas. I want us to all sit around and talk about it. It's almost like a book club, your cookbook. Yes. Like you yeah. don't want to just, that's why we're texting because you don't just want to have the cookbook. You want to talk about it with someone. That's well, y'all should, should have, um, I'm sure that a lot of people, tons of people have done like book clubs with your books. But one of the fun things that I've noticed over the years is people doing these cookbook clubs where yeah, awesome everybody idea. they're reading it together and then everybody picks a dish and then they, so they cool. go and um cook and um send me pictures and make oh aprons it's awesome. <laughs> awesome yeah that's oh, actually yeah. A, a program we do in the libraries well mm -hmm. the the before times everybody would come and check out the, the before times <laughs> and, and, and cook it and bring it and we'd all talk about it and it was one of my favorite things to do Oh, y'all, I want to get together and do that with this cookbook. Mm -hmm. And except you have to come, Vivian, or we'll be disappointed in you. Right. So, <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> Vivian, we would it's never ask you to do that. <laughs> never. We're totally kidding. Now that you know how I feel about it. Yeah, <laughs> never. You know, there's oh. a 50 50 chance I'll come because I don't want to disappoint anyone. That's my point. <laughs> but let me Which say this we about. We even do it to you. I'm just kidding. I would like to say about this cookbook in particular, like leading up to the, the holidays is that like the, the, the condiments, the flavor heroes are the most amazing gifts that you can oh give my gosh, so for my Christmas gosh, yeah. or Hanukkah or whatever. Um, and so, you know, I keep reading all these things about supply chain issues and, and wouldn't we just like to give people something that's consumable that's yeah. awesome. I don't want anybody to give me a lamp. I want to pick my own lamp. Um, yeah. So, yeah. You like, guys, can you not send that lamp to her that we were going to send the lamp we were going to send her? Too late. I already sent it. Okay. Uh, well, right. I'll, you know, I'll trade it in for the lamp I want. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Real You're not going to yeah. feel guilty about it either. Not one bit. Boundaries. All right. No, boundaries. Exactly. I don't have. <laughs> she has lamp boundaries. All right. Speaking of book recommendations, y'all, I know we told you at the beginning that we had a cover to show you. And we know how much y'all loved Mary Alice Monroe and Angela Mays, The Islanders, this past summer. And they have a sequel coming out this next summer. And it is called Search for Treasure. The young boy who was in The Islanders, Jake, is back on Dewey's Island. And this time his dad joins him for a summer and Jake soon learns there is treasure to discover. Remember when you were kids and you always hoped there was like buried treasure in the yard. Mm -hmm. um, so his friends, Macon and Lovey, join him and the search is on as long as they can steer clear of Al, Big Al, the biggest gator on the island. So on Mary Alice's website and social pages, there will be news about a special pre-order giveaway and readers will get a signed book plate and adorable alligator bookmark clip. Isn't that yeah. such a cute cover? That's a great cover. I love I don't it. Know, that's kind of a terrifying alligator, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. It kind of reminds me of Peter Pan, though. Like a Peter oh, Pan. oh yeah. it reminds TikTok, me of the TikTok, pond TikTok. across the street from my house. Peter TikTok, Pan. TikTok. TikTok. I was at your, the last time I was at your house, it was like dark and I was walking out to my car and I was like, what if there's an alligator? And I can even, I know, I know. it's like dark. I mean, they're not like street lamps. It's like dark. And I was like, oh my gosh, like this is where it ends for me. And I didn't even talk. <laughs> She's going to be the alligator story. Yeah. Okay, Vivian, if you don't mind sticking around for just a couple of minutes, we have one more question for you before we go through a couple announcements. Absolutely. Thanks. Okay, so if you're not hanging out with us yet on the Friends and Fiction official book club, 
you are missing out. The group, which is separate from us and is run by our friends, Lisa Harrison and Brenda Gardner, is now more than 10,000 or close to 10,000 mm -hmm. strong. Awesome. Um, so join us tomorrow, November 18th, on the Friends in Fiction official book club for Friendsgiving. We have all posted some recipes there, uh, speaking of cooking. And so make sure that you come hang out tomorrow night at, um, is it 7 o'clock Eastern? 7, yes. Right. Yeah. And speaking of 7 o'clock Eastern, yeah. next week on the Friends in Fiction episode, uh, it's the 24th, uh, right here at 7, like I said, Mary Kay will be hosting the 100th episode of Friends in Fiction. I That's 100. One zero zero. Wow. Well, there's a great graphic, too. Uh, they, the ladies thought that they were gathering for a few weeks, a couple months at most, and look at them all now. They'll welcome Ellen Hildebrand and Tim Ehrenberg. Then in two weeks, join them as they welcome Chris Swan and John Hart. And if you're ever wondering about the schedule, it's always on the Friends and Fiction website. And also the fall schedule is up on the Facebook banner on the Facebook page. And have you heard about our amazing reading journals? Talk about the perfect gift. They're out now from Oxford Exchange. You can add them to your um, Christmas, your holiday reading package that includes um, My Christmas in Peachtree Bluff. Patty's Once Upon a Wardrobe, and Mary Kay's The Santa Suit. Um, you can also add The Forest of Vanishing Stars if you have not gotten your copy yet from Kristen. Um, but you can buy this alone. You can buy it as a part of your package. It's a really great gift. We all have ours and are kind of obsessed with them. They're so beautiful. Yeah. They have this great linen yeah. cover and this pretty ribbon and this gold foil, and they're just great. So They're just um, gorgeous. They're For the first time, color. I'm going to keep yeah. track of what I read. I've no. never <laughs> kept track. That's going to be great. New Year's resolution. Yeah. And don't forget about our pad cut. Mm -hmm. That thing. Don't forget about our podcast because it is growing like crazy. And since we have our podcast host on tonight, we will be talking much more about what's coming on at the after show with Ron on our Talking Turkey with Butterball after show. Okay. Now, Vivian, we already asked you about the best way to cook a turkey. Let's talk dressing versus stuffing which camp are you in what's the difference which is better and cornbread or regular bread or neither um well you know i i think that no one maybe i'm being too uh i i, I don't think that people stuff a bird anymore i don't think you stuff a bird i don't think you stuff a turkey so stuffing is that word doesn't make sense right? Oh, I never thought about it that way. Yeah. Um, so we always called it dressing and I don't even know why, except that maybe you're dressing the turkey with it. But um, I grew up eating stofers like the, with the, yeah, um, yep, we all did. Yeah. And, and my mom would put these like raw onions in it and I never saute them. And it's like this, this memory of my job was like mixing the stuffing and like with my hands. And um, it was, frankly, awful. So making stuffing as an adult has been my favorite thing. And to your question about cornbread or um, white bread or whatever, I think the point is to kind of use something that you have. Um, and, like that. Point. and so I think that's why cornbread dressing became a thing because people would have leftover cornbread. And so the, the drier the bread, the better. Um, which is why we, you know, took great pains to buy the Pepperidge Farms, like little crouton-y thing. Stale bread. I mean, yeah. Paying Pepperidge Farm to buy stale bread. I know. They really got <laughs> us there, right? Yeah. <laughs> I can still see my mother with her arms up to her, up to her elbows in a giant uh, aluminum, you know, bowl of, uh, she would let uh, yep. the white bread go stale. And, you know, she would be sitting there tearing it up. Um, uh, the night before Thanksgiving. And, and now she did saute her onions and celery and, and those things. But I think, yeah. yeah, my mom just, just decided to like skip that. She didn't think it made a difference. Yeah. <laughs> it did. <Yeah. laughs> right, my mother really always made a celery and onion batch and a non-celery and onion batch. And I was the only kid that ate the celery and onion batch. And hers oh, my, my mother used to make half of it, um, half of it oyster. Um, dressing. I was just going to say, 
Yeah. My aunt from Chicago would come down every year and she despised oysters and she would make such a big fuss about it. My mother would say, oh, Julia, I just put it in half the pan. She put it in the whole pan. My aunt never knew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oyster dressing is a really interesting thing. Dressing isn't, uh, for me, really funny because I studied abroad um, in Argentina when I was uh, a junior in college and I was there for Thanksgiving and they don't celebrate Thanksgiving there. They don't even eat turkey. And I wanted to like do Thanksgiving. Um, and so we ordered a turkey from Brazil and it came, it was like four pounds, oh nothing with the chicken. <laughs> but yeah. um, but this is the first time I ever cooked without a recipe, is the point. So I, I bought bread in the grocery store, dried it out, used chorizo, and so go wild with your dressing, is what I would say. Nice. I like that. Go wild. And I love thinking about just use whatever. Bread you've got. And it is it is funny. One of the questions we sometimes ask authors is um, what their values were around reading and writing when they were growing up. And for you to hear the values around um, cooking, like that your mom used stofers or didn't saute the onions. It's <laughs> fascinating how we then shift and, and here you are. So Yeah. It's also interesting. My mom made me read 30 minutes for every made me read an hour for every 30 minutes of television I wanted to watch as a child. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So you didn't Genius. ask that question, but there you go. No, I am. I That's answer great. it. That's I amazing. need to say that in my house. That's no, true. it made me hate it. I would lay there and like pretend to read. Okay. But I really loved reading. But the fact that she was making me do it. Don't do Almost that. like a punishment. Yeah. yeah. I wouldn't let my kids watch television on school nights. They still, yeah. they still tell me that they're scarred by it. And no, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> they can take that to a therapist. Yeah. <laughs> well, Vivian, virtual you, therapist. Yeah. The virtual therapist, Vivian, you have been such a joy to talk to. Yes, we could yes. talk to you for so long and there are so many questions rolling in that we didn't get to. So just know you are well loved and people love your work and your cooking and your shows. And we are so honored that you visited us. So thank yes. you for coming. Thank, thank you. I'm so honored Thanks. to be asked. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Have a great Thanksgiving too. Been great. Thank Happy you. Thanksgiving. Happy Vivian. Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. bird. Okay. <laughs> yes. And talk about it. Hashtag Hashtag talk about it. <laughs> Take care, Vivian. <laughs> All right, y'all. That was so great. Now make sure to so stay amazing. around. I know, amazing. Stay around for our Talking Turkey with Butterball after show because Ron is going to catch us up on the podcast. And we have so much to talk about. And don't forget that as we approach our 100th episode next week, you can find all of our back episodes on YouTube. We are live there every week and just like we are on Facebook. And if you subscribe, you won't miss a thing. Plus, you'll have access to some really special short clips from other shows. So come back next week, same time, same place, as we celebrate 100 episodes wow. with Ellen 100. Hildebrand. 100. Who knew when Mary Kay Andrews called us and said, hey, y'all, let's get on a Zoom. <laughs> Look at us. So we'll see y'all next week. Good night, y'all. Good night. But don't leave. Thank you for tuning in. You can join us every week on Facebook or YouTube, where our live show airs on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Also, subscribe to our podcast and follow us on Instagram. We're so glad you're here. Hey, y'all. Welcome to the Talking Hello. Turkey Butterball After Show, where talking turkey doesn't just mean food. Oh, my gosh. She was amazing. She's incredible. She's great. Yeah. It's really funny, like, just to, like, think about, we moved to Kinston, like, right when Chef and the, well, maybe not right, but a couple years after Chef and the Farmer had opened. And, I mean, it was, like, a big deal, but not, like, you know, we would go on Wednesday nights and she would do these chef's tables and talk about all of the dishes, you know, and it was just like, and now I'm like, oh my gosh, she's just like superstar, you know, it's really cool. And, and she's so personable and her right. writing is so authentic and yeah, they um, match up, they match up yeah. just who she is and what she writes. She's authentic. That's another word I kept yeah. thinking of. Yeah. I think yeah. she, I think she unconsciously downplays how important 
voice is in her writing. You're because right, that's, to me oh, what that's, separates, good. that's to me what separates the narrative in her cookbooks mm -hmm. from some more who just, you know, other cookbooks will give you technique and they'll give you right. very strict cool. rules on measuring and uh, those kinds of technical stuff. But when you pick up a Vivian Howard book, you're picking it up for the voice, I think, as much I as agree. for the recipes. I agree. And so many people aren't writing their own cookbooks too. I mean, you know, so many yeah. cookbooks out there are, are ghostwritten. And so, you know, that she actually writes her own and she's right. Like even in her recipes, you can hear her voice, which is really, you can hear her voice. You can, yeah. When you were saying that Patty earlier, I was like, yes, you're right. Now that I know yeah. her voice, I you read know, when it just I, like it. When I did the beach house cookbook, we mm -hmm. used a recipe tester and food stylist and food photographer, um, a group of women, um, Liz Demos, who I knew and had known for a long time, who's a magazine photo stylist. Um, so she put the team together, but this team had done, uh, I don't know how many other cookbooks, including this one cracks me up. They did a cookbook for the Duck Dynasty guys. Oh, oh my gosh, I'm sure they wrote their essays. <laughs> oh, that, yeah, the yeah. Duck Dynasty guys had nothing to do with it, but they were nothing. just like, you know, and then Using they were the like, name. we have to write redneck recipes. <laughs> it's hilarious. Well, and, when and shoot them. Oh my gosh. When she, when she, which was the opposite of what Vivian did, but when there's this little section in the front of the book where it says, what would Vivian do? And they're, I mean, I read them out loud to Pat last night because they're hilarious. They're like she would tell you to make sure you have a, what an X inch chef's knight that fits well in your hand. Ten right. Just these. Yeah, yeah. Ten. Is that what it was? 10 inch. And I just like all these little hints and clues. I just, I know I keep going on about it, but no, I, I learned so much by getting her um, mail order stuff during the pandemic. I, I just, I can't say enough about it. So Ron, we are so psyched to have you come from behind the podcast microphone to join yeah. us on the screen. So behind talk to curtain. everyone that's watching. Tell us a bit about all the exciting things going on with the podcast. Oh my God. There's so much. We are already looking at but we're booking into like March of next year. So I'm yeah. not going to give too much away, but the next few weeks are going to be amazing. Um, this week uh, we have the return of Mary Alice Monroe. She's with a couple of her um, publishing buddies talking about writing for children. And I just got a sneak peek of the episode for the following week. And it's so good. We're going to break it up into our first ever two part episode. So it's country that. music legends, Kim Ritchie and Gretchen Peters. And it yeah. gave me goosebumps to listen to them again on this. They sing. It's just incredible. And um, it's just, I can't wait for people to hear it. So mm -hmm. stay tuned for that for next week. Then the following week, Patty, you you and I did one together recently yeah. that was really exciting about a book, Doctors and Friends by Kim Marie Martin, yeah. all medical fiction, but it's kind of terrifying, kind of yes. terrifying because it's she was writing about it's the prescient. pandemic. Yes, yeah. yes. So how many episodes are we up to now? Like 30 maybe? <gasps> at the end of this, at the end of this month, the music episode, the first one is going to be our 25th episode. My gosh, every it's, single Friday and every single Friday, 25. And, and I, again, I, I just can't thank you all enough for having me That's join so you to do these oh, things. Wow. Just, uh, you have no idea what it's doing. It's just, uh, I love it. I love it so much, so much. And tomorrow it's like a personal thing. Christy and I would, would bond over this one tomorrow. I'm actually, um, anybody has anybody a fan of the housewives or Bravo out there? Yeah. Yeah. I'm so jealous. So Amy Phillips, who does impressions of all the housewives, is put out a cookbook with an actual chef about um, and, and kind of making parody of the housewives, some of their famous sayings and situations. And it's actually a great cookbook. I've been making things from it. It's amazing. So that's coming up soon in early uh, December. But I get to hang out with Amy Phillips and all the housewives tomorrow. So oh my stay gosh, tuned for that. So <laughs> fun. So yeah. great. That's going to yeah. be fantastic. Yes. Really fantastic. You know, I had a good time um, a couple weeks ago when I did the podcast um, with um, Stuart Krzyzewski, who's my literary agent, my longtime literary agent of more than 20 years, and his wife, Pamela Dorman, who um, is the head of Pamela Dorman uh, Books, at, which is an imprint at Viking. And um, 
I've known them for a long time, and I think I think they're really uh, interesting people. They're fast. They're funny. They're so smart. Um, and so um, I had as much fun asking questions and hearing their answers that I, I hope, especially I think um, aspiring writers will want to listen to. Them. But also people, if you love books, I think it's interesting to find out, well, what is a what does an editor look for in a book? And what does what is an agent looking for in a book? And and Stuart talked a little bit about how he 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 some he said, you know, whenever I've I've um, taken an author or a project on because my head told me it was the right thing to do. He said, it doesn't work out. It has I to be that. my heart. It has to tell me, my heart has to say, you've got to have this. And then Pam talked about being, she's so competitive. Competitive. Yeah. She said, you know, when, when she gets, when she gets a manuscript, um, an agent, um, um, an agent um, gives her, she said she'll lock herself in the room and, and the whole time she's reading it, she'll freak out. Oh, I got to get it. I got to get it. I got to get it. What if someone else gets it? And I, I just thought I love that. So I think I hope it, I hope people enjoy listening to it as much as Ron and I enjoy doing it. It's oh, it's so, so fantastic. interesting. Yeah. In fact, I got a fan letter today that I forwarded to you. Somebody I know. Sent me and a, I forwarded um, it to Pam. Did you? Okay, good. Yeah. So it's nice. People are listening and they're loving it. So yeah. it's great. And, you know, that there's such a theme, you know, if you think about like what Vivian was talking about tonight and talking about Stuart and Pam, and I think about the episode, Ron, that we did with Allie Larkin and how she was talking yes. about, you know, being with an editor that really wanted to change the story. And she was like, this in so many ways is the story of my life. And if this is an authentic story that I'm telling, I can't change it. You know? yes. And, oh, um, God. and I mean, really, like, I think about something like really in particular that, um, that Vivian turned down and I, I don't think I could have. You know, like she was like, it's just, yeah. it's not, it's not the thing. It's not the thing. And I'm like, I can't imagine turning that down, you know? So it's really interesting to just kind of think about recentering and feeling like, you know, what is it that I'm supposed to be doing? Where is it that, you know, my heart tells me and, um, you know, what's the book I'm supposed to be writing? What's the That's project right. I'm supposed to take on? Cause it is easy to get really caught up in so much noise, you know, and you do get to a point where you have to turn some things down. I'm so good at it. <laughs> oh, yeah, all of us are. I'm so saying good. that's like I don't think so. It's all like, of us are so we were, good. We were at all it. laughing. Yeah. We Pros. Were laughing and we were like, when do we agree to all this stuff? And then it's like it all comes up at once, and you're like, oh god, <laughs> who said yes to this? Who said yes. Oh so, <laughs> my god, it's so true. So Ron, you have Nancy. You and Nancy Johnson are doing something too, right? Yes, we're putting together something to celebrate the paperback release at the end of January for her, The Kindest Lie That We Love. And okay. we're inviting a new debut author on with us. And it's still details to be worked out. But um, cool. it's gonna so she's like, going to co-host with you. That's awesome. Yeah, so she's going to co-host. And we're, she's going to pass off the baton a little bit for debuts. Oh, yeah. I love that. Yeah. Um, and we interviewed Kimmery Martin, which was so her book, um, Doctors and Friends. Which was so interesting for me because she's an ER doctor and I used to be a nurse and she takes her experiences from being a doctor and writes these astounding medical um, narratives that are so interesting. And I've never approached a story from, from my old job, but she wrote about the pandemic before the pandemic. It's crazy. So the book it's is scary. about a pandemic that hits. I know, I know. So, Ron, we've all talked about our Thanksgiving plans. What are yours? Well, apparently I'm spatchcocking a turkey. Yeah. Yes, you are. I am. I am. I actually ordered it from the butcher, although I'm really good at a chicken. I have never done a turkey to mm -hmm. do all that. So the butcher's doing that for me. Do you do your chicken on the grill or do you do it in the oven? Both, both. And okay. I'm actually going to try the turkey on the grill. But now mm. after hearing Vivian, I want to try that layer of bread. Yeah. I do too. The, I'm like. That makes it sound easy instead of all the other stuff. I know. But we're yeah. very traditional. I very traditional dishes. The things I mix up a lot are the like the sides. Like I'll, I think this year's going to be some kind of a kale dish, or I've done butternut squash mm. salads and different things like that. But the main thing is that this year we're eating at home. Since I moved oh, to Ohio, we always yeah. ate at a friend's house and had an amazing time, wonderful time. But I would always have to come home and the next day go to the store and buy all the things again so I could make Thanksgiving dinner again oh, because wow. I didn't have leftovers and I love the process. Yeah. So, so I do it again, but it's going to be traditional. It's going to be traditional. <laughs> I know I'm afraid to 
change. Uh, thanks to all playing this patchcock drinking game. Thank you, Sean. That's a fantastic. <laughs> That's a great idea. That would be hilarious. We should have made that our like if we had known our secret tonight. <laughs> I am going to spatchcock a pomegranate. <laughs> you always win. Um, but you, we're such traditionalists. I would be, and it's such, you know, the whole Henry family gets together and Pat's mom is a, a huge, you know, traditional gourmet cook. I would be terrified to spatchcock that chicken, that turkey. Oh. So, and, and Meg asked a great question on the chat. She said, does it um, ruin the presentation value for Thanksgiving? I don't think anybody cares about the presentation. Anymore. Yeah. You can... I don't know about the turkey because the turkey's bigger, but like it, sometimes if Will does a chicken, he'll like you can put it back together on the plate. Like if you don't, oh. right. like you, because you're splaying it out, but it's still like, yeah, we don't carve our, Tom, we don't carve the turkey at the dining room table. That's too messy. No, no. Tom does, no. Tom does all that. very Norman turkey. Rockwell of you, Kathy. I know, but we're not a very Norman Rockwell group. Well, it makes <laughs> me think of um, Christmas with the, what is that hilarious? Christmas movie. Oh, Christmas um, Vacation? The Griswold, and he Griswold. cuts it oh, open, yeah. and it just, <laughs> all the smoke comes out of it. But y'all, like, crazy. no joke, I feel like that is a lot of times how my turkey is, like, I will pull it out, and I'm like, this is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. It's, like, golden and glow. I never make the one for, like, the main event. Sometimes I'll try to make one, and I'm like, this is gorgeous. Like, this is an award-winning turkey. And then I carve it, and I'm like, so I actually bought one, um, the, the one I made a couple days ago was... Like Butterball does these ones that are like in a bag, and you actually yeah, that's what we did too. In the bag, it was so good. I was like, this is the first like non-dry turkey I've ever made because you there's like you can't mess it up. You stick it in the oven in the bag, and it like yeah. yep. all the juices in. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna go find one of those. Yeah, we we did one um, last Sunday, and it was delicious and simple. Mm -hmm. um, everyone loved it. We had enough. I think we had six for dinner. And we had enough. We have a, a neighbor who doesn't cook. And so um, we usually call him and say, hey, come get a plate. Um, so, yeah, that was. And they have um, they have a boneless one, too, a boneless turkey breast. Mine was a boneless breast. Oh, mm -hmm. See, mine had the bone in. And I like that because I'm going to I've saved the carcass to make gravy. Oh, I'm going to go make okay. turkey stock for my gravy. So it's many cooking soup. bowls. It's Sorry, soup. the breast actually had a gravy packet in it. We didn't I use know. it. I know. We had that too. Yeah. Oh, you did. Because I like carved it for um, dinner, <laughs> I mean, for sandwiches and stuff. But um, yeah. it was great. Yeah, I saw your picture of it and I was like, oh, butterball turkey in a bag. Oh, I'm hungry. Nice. When is Thanksgiving? <laughs> I'm going to, um, I'm going to, um, start uh making my gravy stuff tomorrow i think if i have time i made my I cranberry to, sauce i hope to it. video it and i'll post it. it yeah um so i bought some turkey wings and a turkey neck which is what my mother always used to use and i actually actually just because i found them i found some butterball um turkey drumsticks so i'm going to roast all of those off yeah. And uh, use the pan drippings um, to make my gravy ahead of time. Please video oh, that. Yes. Please. Unless it looks terrible, then I won't. <laughs> Do it. It won't look terrible. It'll be great. It'll you know, be what's fun. sad is, you know, I'm at the age where um, I used to could call my mom and say, hey, mom, how did you do that? you know, how, you know, what, what how do I use what? And, and she loved to tell everyone how to do everything. <laughs> and because you were, there was only one way to do it. Right. And it was Sue's way. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I can't do that anymore. But she did. She did tell me a lot of, about it. And so now my kids have to call me and ask me. And we have to call you and ask you. I don't so. know that you're going to watch I actually, it was really fun when we were getting those art, those um, recipes together for Kristen. I actually went to see my grandmother that day and I was like, oh, I gave her the brown rice recipe and I'm just checking it. It's this, 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 and this. And she was like, yeah, but she's like, told me this thing that I'd forgotten. And I was like, oh, yeah, it was yeah. really funny. So it's amazing. It's passed down. Oh, nobody, somebody says nobody's mentioned the Thanksgiving desserts. Oh, well, those are the best part. Real whipped cream with real heavy cream whipped in the kitchen in a cold metal bowl. Hello. What's, but what's favorite? the favorite pie? Oh, uh, we can't talk about that, Ron. We have a game next week. We're what? not allowed to tell our favorite pies. It's a secret. To secret. Yeah. Let's just find out next week. It's just me. 
I always make friends. I always make Andy his own. He loves pumpkin pie so much. Yeah. So I, you know, when you buy a can of that uh, pumpkin pie filling, it makes two pies. Yeah. So one pie is strictly his. No one can touch Andy's pumpkin awesome. pie. <laughs> and there's I have a recipe for it in the um in the Beach House cookbook. And the yeah. and when I was researching that recipe, I found somewhere somebody said add fresh ground black pepper. Oh. And it is amazing. I love that idea. What fresh ground black pepper does to a pumpkin pie. A pumpkin pie. I mean along with the cloves and the nutmeg, it really wow. kind of it kind of brightens it somehow. The cranberry sauce I made yesterday and have all children ready to go added ginger and pepper. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I it's delicious. Yeah, I, but, I think I'm making that this year. I usually do some kind of a fun, but it's usually like, you know, orange and cranberry, but that one I'm red. Yeah. I, yeah. I yeah mine is out. like orange and cranberry and it has pomegranate seeds too. Oh, yeah. Because I fancy like that. Dang. <laughs> I didn't go that far. Spatchcock. Spatchcock pomegranate. Pomegranate. Yeah. yeah. That's what you should take yeah. a picture of. That's what you got to do is take a picture of your spatchcock pomegranate do you actually take them all apart and take all those seeds out or do you I buy them, buy them out those with little jars spoons. of the palms oh. of the, the what do they call them they're they have a name um, those little um, beads um, no they're something sills oh yeah um, pomegranate blah 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 <laughs> i don't know oh god that like makes me feel why can't i remember that it's, i just call them the pomegranate, pomegranate something sills Tills. Somebody, Somebody right is. now is typing it on the page, a hundred percent, and we can't. Uh, sure I hope is. they will. Uh, if Sean, if Sean were any, were worth his a beatner salt, salt, he would be googling that and telling us right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, y'all, talk about cooking. I'm gonna go. Eat. Mm -hmm. I know Tom's yeah. cooking yes. my dinner downstairs. So. Good night, everyone. Wait, we Thank have to you. talk about. We have to talk yeah. about the turkey. Yep. So before we leave, we will see you next week. And just a reminder that Butterball is celebrating the 40th anniversary of its Turkey Talk line, which started as just a phone line, Fresh Arrows. Arrows. That's it. Arrows. Fresh Arrows. Thank you, Meg Walker. It's a good crossword word. Yeah, yeah, it's a good one. And they have a website and they're even on Instagram and TikTok. Of course, we all know that we can call in with last minute questions about our spatchcocking <laughs> on Thanksgiving Day, but they're actually open even now through the end of December. So you have yep. any turkey questions at all, call the turkey hotline and give them a call or check out their website. And that's it for tonight, y'all. We'll see you next week for 100 episodes. Gobble, gobble. Good night, y'all.